TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Oh, uh, man, I had to do some digging to find this, man. Uh, Y'all asking me about where, where are all the documentaries, the gang, the crime. A lot of them get blocked worldwide. And I can't post them ever, so kind of laid off them. But you know, now I'm looking for them again. You know what I'm saying? Because they they they, they were interesting to me. They still are interesting to me, and I want to do them. But you know, most of them get blocked. So here I am again, trying again. Anyway, this is documentary gangs in London explicit. This is from Frontline Syndicate. Might as well. Give him a like. Uh, let's get into this, man. Let's not waste any time. Any more time? Scenes of drug abuse and discussion of violence. Right. Be prepared right from the very start and throughout for highly too, offensive too. language. Scenes of drug abuse and discussion of violence, which may distress some viewers. In Britain, almost 70,000 people across all communities under the age of 25 now consider themselves to be gang members. Gangs are real. Now consider that 70,000 people across all communities under the age of 25 now consider themselves to be gang members. Gangs are real. Because I'm out here, my opinion, man. Yeah. Man, I'm out here every day and shoot bodies out here. In London today, there are said to be up to 4,500 people in close to 250 street gangs. If you just leave your house, not knowing what you're doing, you're fucked. Increasingly, gangs recruit younger members as foot soldiers to use in their drug operations. Drugs is what gets us the money. Everyone here right now wants the money. Man, I'm not getting paid if I want the money. In London in 2017, 25 teenagers were killed as a result of gang-related activity. They've taken away his life, and it's hard to understand why. The pattern of road beefs and revenge provide a never-ending cycle of unforgiving violence. Forgiveness is not an emotion. We don't deal with emotion. In this day, I know I'm gonna die if I don't carry my one. UK gang culture is driven in... in that boy look like he about to fillet the best piece of steak that I ever seen. Influenced by the infamous American gangs, the Bloods, and the Crips. People in London, people in Atlanta, people in New York pick up the gang culture of LA. Where I come from, this shit is how we eat. Gang culture is now destroying families from every community in the UK. He wasn't just stuffed once in the heart or stuffed once in the lung. He was butchered. Dang it. And perpetrators of... Dang. Oh, my God. Fast forward it. You know how you're not supposed to break the ice pack, the, the outside of it? My bad, my foot hurt, y'all, and I was trying to open an ice pack and it bust. So, I gotta get real ice, give me one second. Back, 
Here we go. My bad, I'm gonna edit that out. You probably won't see none of that. They're left to deal with the consequences of their actions. I'm trying to fill a void in my life. The remorse, the regret, the guilt. And to get the inside story from real gang members, we gave them cameras and allowed them to film their own lives. Tell oh, us what lit. it's really like on the streets of the UK okay. today. That's pretty dope. What is there to be frightened of in these woods? As I always say, I'll never fear any man. Make sure a man fears me, though. Yeah? You ain't gotta fear nobody to be deceased. Everybody gotta remember that. To walk out of your house, you're gonna need this one. Show up in the hand. Trust me, I'm trying to change someone down property, bro. I didn't know they was I didn't know they was walking around with a knife sharpener like that. That's tough. That's different. That's like a Chicago dude walking around with a bullet presser or something. That's that's crazy. In the UK, gang violence is on the rise. Bloody turf wars between rival gangs has seen nationwide stabbings increase by 22% in the past year with some victims as young as 13. Families across the country are grieving. Their loved ones are dying as a result of out of control gang warfare. And increasingly, this violence is fueled by a desire for revenge. Not bad, my baby mama texts me. I see the family crying because their child been killed. That's gonna hit even harder now to take on now. Man, those people that's died in it, that I've seen mothers and dads in it, that pain, that they get me from. But at the end of the day, you like, need to know what you're doing for the minute. That get me if you don't know what he's doing, I ain't wrong. And then when he dies, everything comes out at the end of it, that that's, that's how it goes, isn't it? Isn't it? That's crazy because, you know, with that same attitude, you should be able to think like, man, I know what comes with this death coming for this, but, you know, how's this going to affect the people around me that love me? You know what I'm saying? That should be the mindset. You know, as I older, as I got older, I just, these things come to fruition. These things come up in my mind like, dang, I wasn't even thinking about nobody around me until I had my daughter. You know what I'm saying? Then it was like, all righty. <laughs> This is the route I drove when I dropped him off that day. I drove around here. And I stopped right here and let him out. In August 2016, Yemi's 19-year-old son, Andre, was murdered. He was killed by a local gang. I just drove off, went off to my sister's. And he was outside here, just hanging out with the young people, and he was just walking up and down outside these houses. He never moved from here. Um, in the car... Your son was strapping. Just gonna decode that for you, Mom. R.I.P., but your son was trapped. God out there. All right. When it arrived, came from this side and pulled up right in front of the food and wine where he was. Um, and then you can see on the CCTV, his face is like shock horror and he kind of contemplates what he's going to do and then he decides to just run. On the estate where he used to live... Wait, did he get a drive-by or did he get... Stabbed? Andre had a long-running feud with the Shrubland boys, the gang who killed him. He became friends with a young man, but the relationship became bad over a girl that Andre was... Oh, my God, bro. I tell y'all all the time, man, these all these beasts... Almost all the time be over girls, man. You think they care, the women? They think it's a game to them. They don't care. Friends with, and that's kind of how that started because the boy got upset about Andre being in his business. And then that's when the threats first started to come. The boy started sending all these gun and knife emojis to Andre and saying, you know, I'm gonna stab and kill you and I'm gonna shoot you. And I remember Andre showing them to me and like, they had a few backwards and forwards arguments, you know, social media. And then that's when the confrontation started. 
So the first major problem, I got a phone call from Andre and I was asleep and I was like, what's, what's going on? He was like, you need to come now. And I drove up to the spa and I saw him running towards the car, him and his friend. And I said to him, well, I started to drive off. What's going on? And he said his friend had been shot in the face. So I kind of looked behind me and there was this boy in the back of my car with his face pouring of blood. By the middle oh, of that wow. week, they'd come to the house. And the friend in the car got shot. Started That's smashing tough. my car window. And then they just started smashing the windows downstairs in the living room. And then the following night, there was a drive-by shooting. They both had on silver helmets and white T-shirts, and the boy had the shotgun sticking out of a rucksack. Even my son was shocked. He, he, he couldn't understand why they were shooting and where the guns came from. And I don't know why your son was so shocked. All right, pity your son, but I don't know why he was shocked. He knew what this was. That boy sent your son RIP once again. He sent your son emojis, letting him know what he, what type of time he was on. It shouldn't be a shock to your son. To you, yes, absolutely. He knew he had these back, back and forth issues with this group of boys, but all of a sudden it got really serious. When street feuding and beefs escalates on social media, the consequences can be deadly. Obviously, it's to make a small view down here where it's coming from, you get me? Obviously, the men them do it just to show them that man ain't playing, you get me? Big fuck of shit, I want to make it known. The big wax on the banner. Lyrics in music videos that taunt rival gangs glamorize the idea of violent turf war. I got full clip for that movie. I'm trying to do me up one juvie. Who's All right. That was that zone two boy, now the ramp was with. Moscow 17 has a long running feud with rival gang Zone 2 from Peckham. Music videos have inflamed Music tensions have between the two gangs. They're gonna play the whole song? Months during the summer of 2018, Sadiq Kamara and Raheem Barton, both members of Moscow 17, were murdered. I remember this. I mean, I remember hearing about this. This endless cycle of online beef is fueled by the need for violent revenge. iPhone 9, 2, 4, 2, whatever you want to call it. If my friends got hit or shot, I would have to retaliate straight away because the way I am, so if one of my friends got hit, I will go hit the person I hit my friend. There's always going to be retaliation, and we won't sleep until we get our own back. Now, I'm not going to go through the loop, no. We have law in the street. This is a street justice. We, that's how we do it. If you got beef on the road, then you're gonna miss you. You're okay, in it, so you come back. You're looking before him and that. Then I mean, when you try to touch me, you know what's crazy about it, man. This is how a lot of bystanders get involved and whatnot, man. Because like in Chicago, everybody got every. I don't. Every young person got a, a every. Everybody under 45, 45 and under. That's the age. I'm not even playing with you. Even above, got a gun. Like, everybody, man. So, like, it's like if you run up on me, mistaken identity, or you shooting, like, I got to, like, like he just said, you got to, I got to do mine before you do yours, my boy. Because if you run up on me and I'm just walking and you mistake me for somebody, like, I can't play with you because you're not going to play with me. You're not even going to think. You're going to be mindless about it. I wish she stopped texting me. So Andre ran down here um, and the car chased him. So there was two, two on foot running along the pavement armed. In London in 2016, Yami's son Andre found himself in a dispute with a local gang. Okay, my bad. One more time, man. Yami, I know you loved your son, and I know you thought your son was an angel, and I, he might have been. But from my experience, look how heavy they was. They was on your. They was running, bro, down on foot and car. He he. 
line called the Shrubland Boys. On the day of his death, he was chased by four members of the gang in a planned attack. And at this point, the car came back round and pulled up over here. And there were more witnesses around here that said they saw him trying to get in that door over there. They had him up against the wall. Two of them were on him. Witnesses that lived above said that she could hear him screaming. She said, like, she'll never forget that noise of him actually screaming the way that he was screaming. But he still managed to run. They stopped and he still managed to run. There was a blood footprint on this wall where he'd obviously jumped, like, like jumped up and um, he ended up collapsing there on the grass. Right here. Yeah, right here. He wasn't just stabbed once in the heart or stabbed once in the lung. He was butchered. He was hit numerous times with a pole, stabbed numerous times. One of them was pointing a gun at him and saying, you deserve this. And they were just kicking his head in like a football, just booting it. And it was just, his head was just going backwards and forwards like this. And he was spinning around and around in a circle and they was just kicking and kicking and kicking him. And then they just left him there. This. I mean, I, I ain't gonna go by a lot. Like, I, I hear the, the 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 backstory. Oh, it's about a girl. It's about a girl. Nah, bro. Nah, 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 nah. There's too much. There's this is there's too. This is too personal. I get it. Okay, some people will be senseless about a girl. It's stupid, but like they, they he did something. He ran off or something. He did something. <laughs> it's gotta be a little bit deeper. Footage filmed by a local resident. We'll never shows know. Shows paramedics trying to save Andre's life. And then everybody started to come to aid him. And they were saying that he was talking. Can you get my mum? I want my mum. And um, asking for water, which is obviously a sign of a collapsed lung. And everybody did what they could to save him, but he had um, two cardiac arrests. So even at the end, he probably knew he was in a bad way. That sucks. He's still calling for me. Get my mum, like he always did. That sucks. I remember when I got jumped, I was asking for my mom too, man. Was, where's my mom? Where's my mom? I was also asking for uh, this one chick at the time. Well, this is not one chick, you know. She used to be in my videos. If y'all go look them up, she's in a Carl Pilkington video, anonymous. She go by anonymous. Last one for her too. That's deep though. Imagine your child in his last breaths calling for you, and you can't get there fast enough. The whole incident, the whole death haunts me every day. Getting jumped is serious, man. I don't know if any of y'all ever got jumped, but... In the weeks leading up to the murder, the feuding on social media between Andre's group of friends called Money Habits and the Shrubland Boys had reached fever pitch. Uh, he got fed up. Don't be bothered. Don't monk still on the rest of them, yeah? Money Habits, Shankin Habits. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Fever pitch. This is most likely one of the weapons used to kill Andre. Ali Zahawi was one of the three people from the Shrubland Boys convicted of his murder. Today I'm taking Ali the clothes um, because he has one opportunity in a year to get his clothing purchased and taken to him. Dunya is Ali Zahawi's mother. Well, he be in jail fresh. Ali is now serving a 22-year sentence in prison. Vaseline up in there. To, to deal with having your son in prison for many, many years. I, I wish I could have done something about it. I take responsibility for any part that I went wrong because he's my son and I'm his mother. No. It's only when he reached the age of 18 to 20, that's when things start to get really out of shape and, and worrying. 
He was out of education, out of employment, and he became a dad at a young age. Bro came a thug at 18. So the life didn't choose him. He chose the life. He felt like he's helpless. But the real struggle and the real challenge, which, which led to this tragedy, was when he became friend with a new group of young people. And that's where things started to go seriously wrong. These three young people have been having a problem with another group of young people. And then when Ali became their friend, he became part of the problem. She's texting me because my daughter stole on her. She hit her. <laughs> I said, that don't happen to me. I'm big dog. What? <laughs> All right. Anyway. And anytime I, I see her, I just wish that I do anything for her that gives her relief, even if it's for one minute. Because no mother should be experiencing this. True. Your son in jail for 22 years for jumping off the porch at 18 like a dummy. I, I can't even hold it in, man. Stupid. Bro, you 18, jobless, and no edu no more education. That's You're an 18-year-old. That's what every 18-year-old go. All right. You're not 14 in the trenches and your mom is homeless and you ain't got nothing. To, you ain't got no choice. you 18, just graduated high school, and you don't have a job. Every 18-year-old goes through that. I don't know. You wait. From the day when he got arrested, life really... Being a follower, this was... Hey, don't be a follower, people. It becomes meaningless. Happiness is not there anymore. It's a huge amount of conflict. That's how I'm feeling about him. Sorry. For young gang members on the road today, violence, revenge, and retribution are a way of life. And they say that carrying a weapon is a necessity. You know, my mom to be crying, saying she lost their son. So obviously, she been your pocket, she had paid, and you know, obviously, she had it with us for our safety. You get me? So there's going to be no fear at all. It's necessary to carry weapons on the street because people always run home and do something. I'm trying to say like, oh, um, my thing, like, hey, it's normal, fam. Oh, I'll be I'll, I'll be this Ooh, you got the pipe. <laughs> With weapons and the culture of using them now prevalent on the streets, it's not just gang members who are paying the price. YouTube, remember this is for educational purposes. I'm putting up the murder posters for witness appeal from the Metropolitan Police. So I'm hoping that we could jog people's memories and maybe get a witness to come forward to help us help to solve my son's murder. In February 2017, Michelle's son JJ was an innocent victim of gang violence and was stabbed to death in Islington, North London. Hey, you got two kids. He went on a night out in Upper Street in Islington and then he witnessed six people come up and surround a car and stab someone. And I believe that my son went forward to give help to that person because he was known to him. And they stabbed my son in the wood to give help to that person because he was known to him. Because he, he knew and him? they stabbed my son in the heart. This CCTV footage shows the gang moments before and after JJ's murder. Witnesses are scared to come forward, fearing for their lives. And as a result, witnesses are scared. To you see this man right here? 
This is the epitome of minding my business. I tell everybody, mind your business, man. To come forward, fearing for their lives. And as a result, no one has yet been arrested for the killing. I knew the gang that came that night would go undercover and go quiet, and that wall of silence would go up. I'm angry still because a lot of people know what's happened to my son and they're not coming forward and talking about it. I have to keep trying and keep pushing to see what we can do to help this investigation. Like and I said, man, you got to think of it like this, ma'am. Um, if you, if you want to put it in the simplest form, that was your son's boy. I guess he knew him, but like he, your son died because he didn't mind his business. And that's no offense. He lost his life because he did not mind his business. I tell people all the time, coming from Chicago, minding your business is the best way to stay alive. You know what I'm saying? It's as simple as that. I know you're saying he's a human. He wanted to give a helping hand. But you know what I'm saying? You got to make sure they clear. The area is clear before you go give that helping hand. You, they, you, you son see six people, you know, figure eight in somebody and walk up right when they still almost figure eight in them. Like, that's the harsh reality of it. And I, I know I'm being a little harsh, but I mean, that's what it is, man. Yeah, mind y'all business. Wait until the area is clear. I mean, if you want to be a good citizen, just wait until the area is clear. You know what I'm saying? Then go administer CPR. You know, this is my best, this is the best advice that I can possibly give. And I can't sit back and do nothing. In these situations it's like this. It's very important for me to get justice for my son. That's a fact. Even the people on the street know who killed my son are not cooperating with the police because they're worried about being called a snitch or they're worried about what will happen to them. No, they're not worried about being called a snitch because them is bystanders. They're not involved. They're worried about what's going to happen to them. For facts. I've lived and worked in Islington for 90% of my life. Always felt safe. Don't feel safe now. And you hear on a daily basis now that people are being attacked and knife crime is a part of it. If someone chooses to be in a gang, they're choosing a lifestyle. My son never chose that lifestyle. You're right. You're right. Your son they was an innocent my man. Life. They took it. I've lost my baby. He was my only child. And they didn't just take my heart. They ripped my umbilical cord out of me as well. They've taken everything that life was for. And now I just feel, why am I here? There's no purpose anymore for me. Yeah. The purpose of my life was to take care of my child. And I feel I failed him. Honestly, man, you instilled good morals in your son. And he was trying to do the right thing. But, you know, in this world, this is a cold world. This is a cold world, man. The people that do the right things... This is what happened to him. Like, no cap. Like, I'm not saying that. Uh, people, everybody, y'all should do the right thing. But make sure you're doing the right thing at the right moment in time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not just in London that young people are dying from gang violence. Hanif Mohammed is a former gangster known for his acts of violence on the streets of Sheffield. I was a thug. I had over 25 convictions. I, was, I had a really bad reputation. So I lived outside the law, and if you have an issue, how, what do you do? Do you tell somebody? Absolutely not. You deal with it yourself. In a revenge-fueled attack over a local dispute, Hanif stabbed to death an armed rival. He was sent to prison and served 10 years for manslaughter. In he was sent to dispute. Deal with it yourself. In a revenge-fueled attack over a local dispute, Hanif stabbed to death an armed rival. How did he get manslaughter? His lawyer's a god. How did he get manslaughter? He was sent to prison and served 10 years for manslaughter. 
initially, I remember I was a street kid, so my mentality were, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. There was no mercy, there was no remorse initially, because I was still in that space, still in the mindset of understanding that this guy was an enemy. Sit down, darling. Sit down. Bums on seats, please. Sit down. Having kids is, is priceless, really, because I had a lot of anxiety, I'll be totally honest with you, because I thought, I've done, I've done a lot of bad things in my life. I don't deserve all this. I got my demons that I'm battling with for the crime that I committed because not a single night goes by where I don't think about my victim too. And now I look at my son and I think, imagine someone took his life, imagine someone took my life. That's how I look at it. How I was then was just like these youngers now where we didn't give a fuck, consumed by anger, hatred, you know, all this negativity. For Hanif, the consequences of his actions have been long lasting and destroyed his victim's family and also devastated his own. I can't put into words what my uh, parents thought of me back then, you know, when I commit that crime, and they were ashamed, they were disgusted. I think, to be completely honest with you, my mum was in a, in a state of denial, and I said, Mum, I had to sit down one day, I said, Mum, I, I got to break it down, you know, this is going to hurt you, but I orchestrated it and I executed it, it was my shit. Do you know what I mean? Your son did this, it wasn't them. I'm not gonna get away from manslaughter. He's telling us right now he, this is premeditated murder. Okay, we've got nobody, you know? I guess it's like there's America, man. No double jeopardy, man. That's tough. What can you say to a 15 year old boy now that is taking a knife to school every day because he feels like that's the right thing to do? Knife crime affected my life. It turned my life upside down. I believe it's my duty. I don't know, man, because I feel like these parents are first generation. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, like me, like, I don't know, man. Like, I, I, like, I want to put my daughter in a better situation than I was ever in. So it's like, hopefully, like, she would never have to do that. But I'm putting my daughter in, like, Taekwondo and boxing and all that type of stuff so she can defend herself with hands. But, like, for me, it's like, shoot, when I was in Chicago, I carried my pole every day, every single day. So it would be hard for me to tell somebody not to. You get what I'm saying? Because for me, it was, it was like, shoot, I'd rather have it on me than not. Because if somebody tried to run up on me and take my life, I'm not going to go. Period. <laughs> So it's real hard for me to be like, oh man, I, uh, man, don't carry, you don't do nothing. Oh, I can't, I could never tell nobody that because, shoot. When I first moved into my last apartment in Chicago, the second day it was a drive-by. So no, I'm carrying that thing. You know what I'm saying? I've been, I've been blicked at. So no, for no reason too. So no, I don't, I, that's just me duty now to send this message to all the young people. Since her son Ali was convicted of murder, Dunya has been seeking to make amends for her son's crime by working with charities aiming to stop gang violence and knife crime. Why I'm doing this, I'm not looking for sympathy or empathy. I need to tell my story so parents look out for signs and do something. And it's the ordinary people who need to come together to put an end to this. My son wouldn't kill a spider. I, I don't know how he became a knife carrier. He wasn't a knife carrier. And he wasn't Since speaking out publicly on radio about her situation, Dunya has received a large amount... You know what I'm saying? Like, she's first generation. She says it's important for parents to see signs. To but how would you see signs if this is your first time being in this country? You would know, like, what's going on in the streets. You know what's going on in the streets and where you're from, but in here, this street, you don't know, so... Well, how how would those signs become apparent? So I get it. Like, she's trying to teach people what the signs are that she might have missed. But, you know, in, in that moment, that she, when she was living that moment and seeing things, she didn't know. She couldn't have. <laughs> Negative backlash. It was on Twitter and Facebook. I think it was about 122 comments, something like that. And almost all of them are negative you must be so proud love you are part of the problem rotten hell you piece of crap these comments keeps me awake at night when i'm trying to give explanations of what happened how it happened how can we pre avoid this it gets interpreted as a mother coming up with excuses for her son's crime and that's exactly not what i'm doing 
perpetrator's side of the story needs to be told because they know why things can go wrong. That's why I'm putting myself out there. You're going to accuse me. You're going to call me names. You're going to blame me. And I'm accepting that because the purpose is much higher. Things went wrong. I take responsibility. If you blame me, I take responsibility. But there's more into it. If you keep on... I don't think... Sitting here, I don't... I might be contradicting myself. I don't even know. But, like, I, I don't think I ever once blamed her. I'm just saying she wouldn't have no idea what the signs are until afterwards. So I don't really... I can't, you could, I can't put no blame on her. On blaming me, nothing is going to change out there. She ain't never been in the streets, never been attached to the streets. She put like this may be her first time. She about to move to London. Like she don't know. You know what I'm saying? She don't know. I don't like being in a position that makes me feel scared and threatened. I don't like that. But when I'm my life, I feel like I'm super. When you got your life, you don't have no fear. Because at the end of the day, I know I'm gonna die if I don't carry my own. Where they at? That ain't that ain't the UK no more. Is Much it? of UK gang culture has been influenced by America. The notorious feud between the Los Angeles gangs, the Bloods, and the Crips is often cited as the beginning of modern gang warfare as we know it. If a homie get killed by somebody from a, another gang or whatever, straight up, that's it, that's all. We finna go handle that. You know, you killed the homie, we finna go knock one of you niggas off. I feel like YouTube might interpret my reactions as, that's how I be getting blacklisted on YouTube, for sure. A lot of y'all don't see my videos, but they there, but I'll definitely be getting blackballed. Not blackballed, but like, you can't they they don't you don't see them and i feel like they be interpreting me as like perpetuating or glorifying this but no i'm just telling my i'm just telling like i'm hearing their side and i'm really just de dissecting it man. telling you what's really happening <laughs> and like how to avoid this is why i should be doing this on twitch but you know whatever better be caught with it than caught without it that's a fact kill 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 i'm going to get my man not all that, but you know, the first part. <gasps> this birthday is June 4th, and um, I get out here so I can. Uh, it's a Gemini. Pay respects. Former police officer Stinson Brown has witnessed firsthand the shocking gang violence on LA's streets. Ooh. In 2009, his son unwittingly got caught in the crossfire of warring gangs and was killed. When I come out here, it takes you back, it opens up that wound. And as a parent, you'll always blame yourself for the passing of your children. It's never their fault. It's always that. your fault. What could I have done that was better? The night of his son's murder will forever be ingrained on his memory. About 6.30 in the morning on the dot, my doorbell rang. It wasn't my son, it was the detectives. Well, now I know something's wrong. <clears throat> they said, Stinson, uh, do you have a son named Stinson? Amir Brown says, yes, I do. They says, well, do you know he went to a party last night? He says, well, no, he's 21. He's entitled to go to a party. They said, well, Stinson, your son was shot. And he didn't make it. Now, understand with that pause. Damn. Your son was shot. In my mind, I'm thinking, okay, what hospital I got to go to? But when he said he didn't make it, Man, everything in me went to the floor. I was empty. I was confused. Yeah, did I feel hatred? Yeah, I felt hatred, but I was confused. On different very levels, various levels, I had an opportunity to cut up, to see blood for blood on the streets, to live a life of a, a vigilante. It would have been understood, me being a police officer, me being a oh, man who I am, too. to go out and they say, somebody's got to pay. I don't care who, somebody. This is a club that I don't wish on nobody. 
But particularly when you bury your kids, that don't, I don't wish that on nobody, man. Nah. I'm my worst enemy. There's so other things you can suffer from, but not that. Yeah, that's a nightmare. Some of y'all might not have kids, but that's like, I don't know, man. I be having thoughts like, ah, man, ooh. That'd be rough, man. When I got jumped, For many gang members across the UK, losing a friend in a revenge attack is becoming all too commonplace. I've lost loads of people from this, whether you want to call it lethal war, gang violence, gang violence, whatever you want to call it. It's hard. This lifestyle is not fun, it's not games. You know, I've lost people to this lifestyle at a young age. And I know tomorrow I can leave my life. I know tomorrow my time. I was going to say when I got jumped, They called my mom, and when their mom, my mom came back from the hospital, my little brother thought I was dead. You know what I'm saying? That's a feeling that I didn't know that at the time, but like knowing it, like I found out like a couple of years ago that that was the that that, that happened, and I ain't, that was no good feeling to me. You know what I'm saying? So that that alone made me like, nah, bro. <laughs> My little brother thought I was dead. Thought he was going to have to go to my funeral. That ain't nothing cool. That ain't cool. Fun to leave you up. So tomorrow I'm going to leave it. It's like when I'm a monopoly board, this part of the chance. You roll the dice. If you win, you win. If you don't, then you peak. As you can see, this is someone that's just moved into a house. <laughs> it's madness, really. Absolute madness. Nine months after her son JJ was murdered by a London gang, Michelle is still trying to come to terms with her grief. She has decided to move out of London and away from the shadow of gang violence that hangs over the capital. This is um, JJ's stuff, paperwork mainly. This was given to me the day my son died. The criminal justice system. Coping with grief when someone close to you has been killed. That's as much help as I got. I've got nothing nice to say about victim support because they haven't been supportive at all. They offered me counselling, but said that I would have to wait six months. Well, my son had already been dead four months. So I just told them not to bother because it makes you feel like that, unfortunately. I went to victim support. They sent me a voucher for 50 pound for Tesco's. And that's what I received from victim support. It's not what I, and that's why they sent me a voucher for 50 pound for Tesco's. <laughs> that's an insult to injury. And that's what I received from victim support. It's not what I needed, what I needed was some help. And I don't know what help I need. I've never lost my child before and I've never had somebody murdered in my family before. So how do I know what help I need? I still don't feel I should have my son's stuff packed up like this. His stuff should be hanging in a wardrobe, waiting for him to come and wear it. Um, side note, remember, man, I just did a podcast. Um, I think, I think it was a good podcast. It was a good little interview, man. It was a, it's called, it's on a channel called the Blueprint Mastermind and it's episode 11. Um, if y'all, any of y'all get a chance and y'all are interested in what I got to say, go check it out. There will be a part two. So leave comments in there. The link will be down in the description. So it should. No, oh, I said no, fella. I can't do nothing more than that. <sighs> shit, isn't it? That's a shit. It shouldn't be like this. I've moved 
to a house which was going to be a family home. And um, I haven't got my family anymore. My family's gone. And especially when it was so brutally done for no reason. No one can find a reason why my son was murdered. None. For being a good citizen. There ain't no reason. With the gang who killed JJ yet to be brought to justice, thoughts of retribution are never far from Michelle's mind. I could pick up a knife and walk around going, I'm going to start killing people because somebody killed my son. But I know right from wrong. And I know that's not going to achieve anything in the long run. What I need to happen is for people to pay justice and someone needs to pay for murdering my son. I feel very angry that they're still alive because they're the people that went out and did wrong. Even if they give him life for life, even if he gets the death penalty, it still wouldn't be justice. The justice for me would have been my son being allowed to finish his life. No one can ever give me back that. No one. That's what I try to tell, man. People be like, oh, time heals all. now. time don't heal all. Closure do. And this lady need closure for sure, bro. <laughs> time does not heal. <laughs> Look, one of us done. We know a police ain't gonna do nothing. They're not gonna go out there and grab a gun and shoot someone for us or, or go, you know, get revenge, retaliate in any way. They can't. It's impossible. So we write that for each other. We write that for our family. The way we do. In Sheffield, former gangster Hanif Mohammed is still coming to terms with the lasting impact of a violent act of retribution. So where I'm about to go now is the edge of my exclusion zone. So basically, if I were to cross another few feet into that, technically, um, I could go straight back to prison. Having served 10 years in jail for manslaughter, <laughs> yeah. he is now out on parole and forbidden oh, okay. to return to parts of his hometown. I feel like I'm banished from a home, but understandably so. It's justified, absolutely. And there's a reason for it and all, you know, it's about respecting the victim's family. How would they feel? They'll feel justice ain't done. So, you know. At the time of the death, both Hanif and the victim were local rivals who became embroiled in a dispute. I've got absolutely no animosity Over nothing, towards probably. him. Hatred or anger now is replaced by regret. A sense of humbleness, a sense of, I fucked up, man. What can I do? What can I do to change it? I can't do anything. And I'm trying to fill a void in my life. And that void is the remorse, the regret, the guilt. It's something that I did on my own and I have to carry that burden. At the end of the day, I, I deserve everything I got. And to be completely honest with you, uh, if I had been the judge, I would have given myself more. You know, I don't feel 10 years was long enough to take somebody's life. One thing I can't do is compensate for that error. In an attempt to break the cycle of hatred and revenge, you live in the UK. Hanif contacted his victim's family through his probation officer, hoping this would be the first step on the road to forgiveness. Uh, unfortunately, it's something that they weren't interested in, which I have to respect, obviously. They weren't prepared to engage with me, so it is what it is. But I left myself open, and to be honest with you, deep down inside, I'm kind of glad because that would have been the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Looking into the eye of the person who's, you know, I've, I've took their kid away from him. When I come here, this is a time to reflect. This is a time to take account of my life. 57 years that God has allowed me to be on this planet. In Los Angeles, following his son's murder, Stinson Brown found himself at a crossroads. No parent ever should have to bear their own children. I had to make a decision. Do I seek retribution? Or do I start taking a path and the test steps towards forgiveness? I don't need to walk through life being bitter and angry and wanting 
you know, cause harm to other human beings. God's, God is the one that will repay. And it's in his word. So I sought forgiveness. I said, so as a Christian and as a true believer in God and Jesus Christ, I'm going to forgive Pierre White, who was the name of the defendant, for murdering my son. I can't go on living life with hatred in my heart and a cloak of hatred around my neck. I got to let it go here and now. In London, when violence escalates and someone dies, forgiveness is not an option for gang members. Pressure and the anger, my brother is gone, now my close guy is gone. The only thing that goes through your mind is kill. I lost a couple of people to knife him and that. A couple of men that I know been shot and that. Obviously, your man's pissed at it, that losing a brother that just came from this rage, man. Obviously, your man was to bang out and that, yeah. Forgiveness, that's an emotion. We don't deal with emotions. It, it makes us weak. It makes us look like we're surrendering. We're giving up. Now, if I, if I give up in one occasion and other people hear about it, they're going to think we're weak. They're going to want forgiveness too. You don't do forgiveness. And I, I feel it, man. Can't even cap, man. When I first moved here, one of my boys was in Chicago and he got shot and I was so tempted to go back I was this close I was this close but I talked to him he said he was cool I was very close though so it's easy to feel that in your heart like dang so the devil's tempting me <laughs> hi how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Nice to meet you. Who's there? This, uh, As a part mom? of her journey to understand the impact of her son's actions, Dunya has agreed to meet with a mum whose child has died as a result of gang violence. Homari Barnes was 15 when he was stabbed to death outside his school right, gates. I think I remember this story. In an act of revenge, his killer took the teenager's life, mistakenly believing him to be part of a local gang known as yeah. the 365, who had physically attacked and then taunted Kwamari's killer on Instagram. I wanted to talk to you face to face. See what I'm talking about though? Remember I said it earlier? Mistaken identity? I ain't going. To get your story from you. But I do feel that there is also a lot of parents that do need to be accountable. If their kids are getting up to mischief or they're not coming home on time, you as a parent have to step in and take the right measures to safeguard your kids. In my son's case, yeah. And when often I talk about this, I get criticized a lot for it. Mm -hmm. But honest to God, this is a reality. Yeah. My son wouldn't kill a spider. Yeah. So it's the same question of why, mm -hmm. what is happening inside of their mind to make such a huge mistake. Did your son take responsibility for what he did? in terms of what happened? It's a vague situation, mm -hmm. Lillian. He's been convicted, yeah. and what I'm saying is not going to change anything. No, no, about no. I'm just asking because, for me, part of rehabilitation starts from when someone can take responsibility of regardless. Of course. So how does he feel now, a year and five months down the line? Still in the shocking atmosphere of, is this real? Mm -hmm. And why it happened i didn't have anything to do with this and he is very upset for the mother of young person yeah. and the the whole understanding you know when you come to realize that what you were thinking was wrong honestly man i'm gonna keep it real with our son again man 18 he jumped off the porch 18 when you come to a gang and you come and you come at the age of 18 they know you're goofy I'm keeping it above. They know for 100% fact at the age of 18, this grown man is coming into me 
trying to be accepted. He's a goofy. He'll do anything for me. So, so for the simple fact that he went and did that for that gang that he didn't even have no, didn't even have no quorums with, didn't even know what was going on, they knew that he would do that. You're an 18 year old joining a gang at 18. You're automatically a goofy in the members' eyes. That been there since 10, 9. That had no choice. You automatically. That's what you labeled. Even if that's not the terminology they leave it, using, they looking at you like, bro, what are you? All right, you just, I right, bet. Watch this. You gonna crash out first? Cool, crash out then. That's how they As looking at you. come to that stage. He is. I don't know how complete is that. Mm -hmm. Thank you he, for being honest. Yeah, yeah, I don't know how complete is that. Yeah. But for me, rehabilitation starts from him and his acceptance of what he's done. Whereas if someone's just gonna feel sorry for the situation that they've landed themselves in, it's a completely different thing from feeling sorry for what they have done. streets of the UK, when gang violence erupts and someone dies, the strict code by which gang members live overrules everything. They're giving us a lot of option. Why? Because you've done stuff to them. They want you dead. So you can't forgive you to get them before they get you. I mean, how, how do you forgive someone who's, who's taken a life from you? On the other hand, now you've got the person who's done the murder He'll still be living his life, he might be jailed. You can still see his kids, his family. Now that's not fair to me, because my friend's gone, my brother's gone. So you told me, how do I forgive that? It's just not in our world to do that. You're not in the place. The brutality of gang Get activities it. destroys the normal lives of families. Yami's son Andre was murdered following a feud with a local gang. Dunya is the mother of Ali Sahawi, one of those convicted of Andre's murder. Having lived in the same area and passed each other on the streets many times, Dunya and Yemi have finally agreed to meet live on air to try and find a way forward. Yemi, when you see Dunya, what do you see? Who do you see? I see Ali's mum. She's the mother of somebody that killed my child. Oh, this this is... Wow, have I not... I, I didn't even know this was going on. Her son killed her son. She's also a human being. Okay. She's a um, friend. She's not my friend, no. You know, we're two people fighting for the same cause. And um, Dunya, when you see Yemi, what do you see? Who do you see? Um, I see a heartbroken mum who, who shouldn't go through what she went through. And I was so desperate to speak to her just to explain that I don't know what happened exactly. And I'm, I'm end of the day, I'm very sorry. Yes. Um, right. That was a very important step to take because I needed to see this lady and I needed to speak to her. It was something I wanted to do when I was seeing her in the Old Bailey to, to apologize to her. and and she express what I feel. Dunya didn't, she didn't kill my child. No. So even when she said to me, you know, I apologize, you know, I want to apologize to you for, I said to her, you don't need to, you do not need to apologize to me because it's not, this is not what you've done. Yeah. You know, your son made his own choices, you know, like young people do, they're making the choice, good or bad. And they need to take responsibility for what's going on. Some days I feel angry, very angry. Some days I feel nothing. You killed my child, that's, that's it. There's no, <laughs> no explanation for that. There's no reason why you 
did what you did. There's none. And there's nothing they could say that would make me think, oh, OK, all right, maybe I can sympathise or understand why you did what you did, you know. There's no reason. None. Today, we come together to remember before God our brother JJ, to give thanks for his life. One year after the murder of her son by a local gang, Michelle has arranged a remembrance service for him at a local church. JJ, the one who put a smile on your face, the man that always lit up the place, light up the path that your little girls walk and give your mum the strength when she needs to. I think the people that killed her son are... Uh, uh... They bogus. That's all I like. <laughs> Talk. Help her win this battle that you never started against these cowards that left us all broken hearted. Exactly. There's the word. Cowards. Light up the call for the jury to see that people using knives should never walk free. With witnesses still refusing to speak out for fear of their lives, no one has yet stood trial for JJ's murder. If you're in a gang, and if you do know someone that's murdered someone, by being quiet, you're making them into a hero who thinks he can use a knife at every... That's not the mentality, though. If you're in a gang and they, they, they all in that together, they all caught that body. That's the, that go on the scoreboard. Like, no no offense, but like but the people that did take their life of this, this, this lady's child, they weak, they huff. But, you know what I'm saying? The argument. So how do you know you're not his next target? Gang members know they're not worried about what happens to us because it doesn't immediately affect them. We need to take away their power. The endless road beefs and tit-for-tat violence mean that there is little end in sight to gang warfare. Forgiveness, it can only change so much. The truth is it's a vicious cycle. It's going to go on for generations. My kids are going to have problems with your kids. So it's, it's one of those things that never ends. It's going to keep going around and around. And for gang members today, there is no way out of this cycle of revenge. What does it feel like to be stabbed? What happens when you die? Obviously, all these thoughts come to your head because you see everybody else dying around you. I have to tell you, to be next for you now. Tell her leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Y'all heard what I had to say. I'm going.